everybody seems to look the same on this in this medium, this uh, uh, Zoom medium to me, even people on TV, you know, like commentators, everybody looks the same. They've got that kind of homey background and, uh, but so what? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what to do about the background. I um, heard the other day from a friend who took a picture of her office in a very tidy state and then used that as a fake Zoom background, like a photo of the space that she was inhabiting rather than the actual space. But yours looks like your studio and it looks quite tidy, which I would expect it to be. Well, it only, it looks tidy by accident because nobody did any tidying up, but uh, it's an, um, what you're seeing in the background is kind of like a state stationary, you know, it's like permanent almost, and there's not much change to it, but uh, there you go. And you, I take it you're home, are you? Yeah, I'm at home. Um, I live kind of near one of your many old stomping grounds uh in angelino heights and i Where? know angelino heights oh yeah okay i do know it do you remember the pioneer market i remember it very well and actually when it closed um i was hoping somebody would buy the wonderful sign with the covered with the wagon in it. with the cars that move along the little neon cars yeah i do well, remember I think it had a covered wagon. Oh, was that? Yes, that was their symbol, wasn't it? But they also had little cars running across the front of it for a while. Maybe that, um, maybe they broke or something. But it, the Pioneer was a really great market and um, oh, it yeah. was sad that it closed. One thing I was thinking that I want to mention to you, we have in common that we were both paper boys. Okay. <laughs> Do you know what a three corner is? No, I don't re I don't know what that is. Well, it's where you take the paper and you fold it uh, in half. Oh, yes. And then you fold it again and then you twist one side, twist the other side and lock the two together. And then you've got this sort of triangle that you th throw up onto the front porch. That's what we did. I might have done that, but I think that we might have been rubber banding the papers. Yeah, that rubber bands took over. They did. I mean, I didn't have my paper route until I think the summer of 1977, 78. Oh, where was this? Not so uh, No, in Eugene, Oregon. Okay. I delivered the register guard. I didn't move to San Francisco until I was 10. Oh. And before that, in the summers, I took over the paper route of another kid, a boy, uh, a proper paper boy, um, you know, speaking of that era, who did that route during the year um, and was gone in the summers. And I have always um, suspected that delivering papers had something to do with who I am. And I've, you know, you one is wary of too much self mythologizing, but when people ask me about things in interview in childhood, it often comes up for me, as I've noticed it does for you. Yes. Um, and I remember uh, the system was that uh, to be a paper boy, you would buy your papers and resell them. So you'd get a little bill for all the papers you took on and then you would collect the money from the people that took the paper from you. And uh, I don't know whether that's a system anymore, but uh, I'm talking about the 1950s. So we got a, a big gap in there. And uh, I'm surprised actually that there are even newspapers today. So you just had this show open in Oklahoma. And I guess I was thinking about your background more because of that. It's like, a return. Yeah, and uh, I haven't haven't seen the show because I haven't traveled. But and I may not even be seeing that show. I don't know yet, depending on how you know the outcome of everything this lockdown. And uh, but it was a kind of return to 
home turf and but I've been regularly going back to Oklahoma over the years. You know, I grew up in um, Dust Bowl type of atmosphere, like like it was a black and white movie, and uh, very much Jim Crow laws took place. So I left all that, and um, I look back on it kind of like it's a everything's in black and white to me. And then when I get there, I I see that in many ways they're far ahead of us. I mean, you can't drive down the any little town street that you don't see sometimes two or three marijuana dispensaries. They're right. everywhere. It's exploded in the state of Oklahoma. So, you know, there's a big change. Well, when I was there, I went to the uh, Bob Dylan archive. <clears throat> His okay. house in the Country Music Hall of Fame seemed like Bob Dylan is making himself some kind of a, not a home in Tulsa, but a home for his papers. I asked people there about Larry Clark because when I was growing up, Tulsa was the thing you needed to know about. And it was like underground literature in a way that book had completely sold out. You know, it was really hard to find. Um, like with your books, it had been stolen from every library where it was housed. And when I asked people in Tulsa, they all responded in the same way, which was interesting to me. Oh, Larry Clark, Tulsa, that doesn't represent us. And um, people told me that there were Tulsans who were embarrassed that Larry Clark had made a book and given it the name Tulsa of their city. But then it was photographs of nude people shooting heroin. And they <laughs> thought, that's not Tulsa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I would imagine you'd get that reaction. But uh, on the other hand, I guess maybe it is Tulsa, isn't it? <laughs> right. Yeah, it's, it's not the one that they wanted to promote. And when you go there, you do feel, I don't, I don't know if Oklahoma City is like this as well. I don't remember it in this way, but in Tulsa, you do feel that something of the more conservative culture from the 50s and 60s has been preserved, even in the look of the architecture. Um, and, you know, I guess being a Bible Belt place, something about the oil industry and, and the strong culture of the church in combination is interesting to me because um, it's not my experience at all. In fact, that reminds me of um, something I want to ask you about. Uh, in looking over the long history of your work, there was this show called Three Catholics. Does that ring a bell? Oh, yes, yes. Um, and, um, <clears throat> I'm trying to, I'm reaching here to name the other two, but uh, was it Andy Warhol? Uh, and who's the third? Maplethorpe. Oh, Maplethorpe. Robert was a Catholic. I didn't, yeah. Okay. Someone made that up. Was that Dave Hickey or someone like that? that uh... I don't think it was Dave Hickey. It was before him, although that seems like it would be his sense of humor, doesn't it? I like it, doesn't it? It's Dave all the way. <laughs> but it's also kind of, I don't think it was Walter, but it's kind of reminds me of something Walter Hopps would do too, in the way that he could make a blunt category that was a new category, that he was just inventing as though it had always existed. Yeah, just like he came up with this term, new painting of common objects, which was Very really kind of pop art, I guess, you know. And you were in that show. Yeah, now, not to change the subject, but did you know Gene Stein? Yeah, so I knew Gene um, in fact, I, I worked for Jean at her magazine, Grand Street, yeah. for uh, several years when I was younger, and so that's how I got to know Walter. Good. I'm glad you, I, that was my next question. Did you get to meet Walter, or as we call him, Chico? Walter, um, he really made a huge impression on me as he you know, has on many people. And one day he came into the Grand Street office and he said that um, 
in the 1950s, he'd gone into the Frick very depressed on a day when it was pouring rain. And he went and he stood in front of a Rembrandt to try to make himself feel better. And there was another man also standing there in front of the same Rembrandt. And um, it was Edward G. Robinson. And um, they started to talk and Edward G. Robinson said, can I buy you lunch? So they went to that diner, which you've probably been to that was down the street from the Frick that where Walter liked to hang out. And um, Edward G. Robinson told him this story about owning a Cezanne painting. And then he would turn the light on in the middle of the night and look at it when he felt really suicidally depressed and it made him feel better. And I guess Walter had told me these long stories um, and I'm glad I wrote them down. Well, Walter was so uh, encyclopedic with all the artists that uh, were in the world. And he, uh, he made a point of uh, not dramatizing one particular artist, artist because they were famous. He liked those artists that lived way off somewhere and didn't uh, and were not known by other people. So he championed people who were remote and lived in the sticks. Another person we know in common is Billy Al, although I haven't talked to him uh, in quite a while. Okay, well, an old friend got me into motorcycling and um, we would go to Mexico, go to Baja. And uh, this was after I watched him race at Ascot Park, which I, you mentioned in your book too, didn't you? Uh, something about Ascot Park. So you probably went there, didn't you? No, that was kind of before my time, but there's this famous movie by H.B. Hallecky called Gone in 60 Seconds. Oh yeah. And it has um, that phrase is from Ascot Park because they ask people to lock their cars or your belongings will be gone in 60 seconds. So I mentioned it as the origin of the title. Um, but I'm not surprised that Billy Al was riding motorcycles there. We would have a great time going to Mexico. And um, I hated highways. I didn't like to get on paved highways. Too unpredictable. What were you riding? Um, it was a Honda 250. And then I also had um, a BSA 441, if you were uh, that one. Um, Victor is what it was called. Yep. Yeah. And uh, that's a big, heavy motorcycle. And um, the Honda was more sensible and lighter weight and all of that. Well, that I understand. I don't know if you saw that I have a long essay in there about motorcycle riding. You do, I know. <laughs> um, yeah, and so uh, I'm kind of um, sensitive to these differences, having owned Kawasaki's and having owned Moto Guzzi's and uh, Kajiva's. In the one case, you have to be really committed to everything unique about the feel of an Italian motorcycle and how it's handcrafted. But that also means that um, you're constantly working on it and it's temperamental. Whereas the Japanese bike is more straightforward. It offers kind of less of the beauty in terms of the feel of its acceleration, but it always starts. Always starts, yeah. <laughs> I was thinking about horizontal Tality, kind of an ugly word, but does the job. Um, I saw this, that short film that I think, I guess Gagosian had either made or funded um, of Eddie, who is a friend of mine, your son, and Flea in your studio talking about new works. Oh yeah. And um, there's one painting, there's a very long painting of the American flag, which seems like it's been a trope of yours for a long time, is extending things to the right. Well, most most things that I produce come about by a lack of planning. And um, I want to go back and say, well, where did that come from? And, and then I might say, well, I really, I have the same menu for everything I do, but they don't, there's no recipe to it. And so I, I wonder where they come from. And, uh, but a lot of it, you can say, yeah, it is tied to the horizontal. And uh, 
the endless flag is uh, just another step of uh, things that I've done before, but I still don't quite understand. So it's all puzzling, puzzling, you know what I mean? I love it. It's, it's oblique and it could go in a lot of different directions for a viewer. In terms of on the road, I was wondering, this is a smaller question about um, Royal Road Test. I, uh, perhaps that was just the typewriter that you had or you liked that phrase, Royal Road Test, but didn't he write that book on an Underwood typewriter? That, I don't know. I don't really know what kind of typewriter he used, but you know, the famous part of that is that he did it on a long piece of paper, an extremely long piece of paper. Right. But kind of typewriter, uh, the model of typewriter, I don't know. I don't know. Our book, uh, Royal Road Test, that was a complete accident waiting to happen and uh, not planned out in the least. And we were in Las Vegas and had uh, an old Royal typewriter that I had and it had a, a broken frame on it. And it was kind of sad because of this frame. It, it wouldn't allow you to type on it because the frame was cracked. And we had this thing and driving back on the highway, deciding to just throw it out the window. And, um, and we did uh, and drove on about 40 or 50 miles and then began thinking about it and talking about it with my friend Mason Williams and uh, Pat Blackwell uh, and thinking that maybe we should, maybe let's go back and see what that looks like when you throw a typewriter out of the window of a moving car. And uh, then on, when we returned to the site, we could see that this thing looked like um, it needed some sort of forensic investigation. And so Pat had a camera and a lot of film and uh, thought, let's just record this thing. And as we do it, we'll pick up all the pieces, bring them back to Los Angeles, take them to a typewriter shop and have all these pieces identified. And uh, because each, each little gizmo would have its own name and uh, a definition for each one of these mechanical devices. And, and then it became um, really, we knew that we had, we were working in service to the final result, which let's make a book. And so the making of the book is the deal. And we just carried it through that way. I'm more invested in classic cars than I am in classic typewriters. I know you are. Well, that, you, you jumped from motorcycles to cars and that was that lifted my eyebrows right there. So I have an old Galaxy, is that right? You yeah, I have, that? sorry? You still drive that Galaxy? Yeah, I do. Um, yeah, I have a 64 Ford two-door um, hardtop. And um, I've had a number of classic cars over the years, but um, this one was the first car that I ever owned. Um, I bought it when I was 22 or 23 years old, um, which was at this point, a long time ago, uh, 30 years ago. And um, over the years, I just never got rid of it. And at this point, um, I never can. I mean, I'm just so deeply tied to the car. Like I was reading the other day about, they discovered this uh, chariot in Pompeii that was underneath the ash. And I thought that's, that's gonna be my galaxy someday. They'll discover it, you know, <laughs> and me in a thousand years and we'll still be together. Well, it just shows you that cars are part of your fiber, I guess, and when I was, Growing up, I, I wanted to get a car when I was 16 years old and I bought this 1950 Ford, four-door sedan. Um, and um, then right away, I um, uh, a neighbor was selling a 1948 Cadillac convertible, dark blue Cadillac convertible. And I was asking my friends about that. And they said, oh, you never, never go back in years when you're buying a car. <laughs> 
because you'll just be stepping back in in history and you'll you'll be sorry for yourself that's two years earlier and it didn't matter to me it's just that that cadillac well of course it was a cadillac and i never made the move on it but i kept my ford for a while and then uh, just sort of evolved from then that is so funny i mean there are that that attitude is still prevalent i was giving a ride to a friend of mine once who said not obviously not a car person who said this car is so old it's almost worth something just by virtue of being old yeah and I thought, yeah. Well, obviously well, then i actually i did jump backwards when i came to california because i was driving along los Feliz boulevard and i see a 1939 ford for sale for 40 dollars and i bought this car and uh for 40 dollars and i drove it for about three weeks and then the engine blew up and uh i parked it in a garage for a decade and then I had the thing restored and had a new motor put in it and I still own this automobile. It's in a, a shop out in the valley right now being tuned up, but um, I've it's been several lifetimes with me almost. It's had a couple of different paint jobs. It was a light green color when I bought it and it's now black and uh, but I still have it and um, you know, there you go. There's, that's my chariot. Well, I know what I was going to ask you. What do you think about Kathy Acker? Kathy Acker? Do you know her work? Yes, I do. Uh, not super well. I've read a couple of her books and um, I would say I'm more aware of her as an icon and a set of gestures yeah. than I am as somebody who like I would, you know, curl up at night with one of her books to read. When I was um, living in San Francisco as a younger person, I used to go to uh, Gold's Gym and there was always this, um, I, to my mind, kind of corny motorcycle parked out front, like um, a Virago. Do you remember those bikes? It was supposed to look like a cruiser bike, like a Harley. Yeah. Japanese. Yeah. And it had like tassels on the handlebars and these big cowhide saddlebags, not my style at all. And then there was this woman um, who came into the gym every day, kind of came clanking in with big fry oil resistant motorcycle boots and a big jacket that had hand painted girl on the back. And <laughs> later I found out it was Kathy Acker. <laughs> Okay. So I had this impression of her from that. Um, but I read a little bit of, there was a really great book that Chris Krause wrote about her, a biography. And um, she did seem like a very ambitious person who had a lot of ties to the art world of her time. But I mean, why do you ask about her? Uh, well, because I think she's uh, uh, on the outside of literature, maybe. Somehow I got on her mailing list um, and she produced these little books that looked like she made them herself and they were all typewritten. There was no, no typography or nothing printed. It was almost like mimeographed books put together with staples and they were little pamphlets. And uh, she got my address somehow. And so this was back in the early seventies and started sending me these books and I would get them maybe every few months and they'd all be the same size and the same shape and everything. And then I'd I get into the reading of these things and I, I got the sense that she's gone back in literature and just like taken chunks of earlier books from written in 1850 or something and made comments about it. And actually it, it was, you could call it kleptomania, I guess, you know, using large chunks of other people's writings. So it seemed like it was a, a pre message of what's going to happen in the art world or uh, later on where you start looking around and uh, using anything as art material or literature. And uh, so that's why I thought of her. Like, yeah, like, I guess that's before Sherry Levine, you're thinking like a kind of. Yeah. Pro yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's really interesting. It's more 
like um, an art gesture than a literary gesture. But Could be. I, in, in a way it can be both. I mean, there's a reframing there that makes you think. It certainly takes a lot of gumption. And the self-promotion part of it is kind of interesting. I mean, it's, yeah. it's very different than certain ideas about the writer. The, even, you know, the myth and the reality of the writer is that you're somebody who kind of pulls back from the world to carve out a space from which to observe it and isn't thinking about things like fame and attention and making and having a publisher. It was self-published. Right. That, was, that, was, that made it interesting right there. Well, when you look back on it, I mean, the early 70s, that, that was a, a kind of primitive way of making statements or making art or literature. You know, it was, uh, it's, uh, it's been thought about a lot and uh, it's, I guess it's evolved over the years. Interesting figure. I mean, not somebody for me who was like a touchstone or somebody that I was influenced by at all. But I, I would say I'm, I'm a non, I, I don't appropriate in my writing in that same kind of way at all. I just sort of read things and then um, synthesize them and then they become mine. Yeah, no, I, uh, um, what is the title? Uh, 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 hard Crowd. Well, you know, each one of those stories is uh, off in its own direction. And <coughs> you it, you're writing about it. That makes it sort of 360 degrees. I like that part of it. And uh, I, other people that I read like that are, would be like John McPhee, you know, and he writes about weeds in New Jersey. And then he'll write about something like what truckers, the kind of ionized water truckers prefer to use in the cleaning of their stainless steel tanks that they use. And, uh, you know, uh, they're totally different. Every subject he writes about is something different. And um, I'm... Uh, sort of invigorated by that thought that you, you've been everywhere and you travel too. I mean, you went to Europe and Israel and all these places and you, you get it down. That's good. Well, yeah, I went to, I went to Palestine. Um, that came somewhat out of the blue. I was asked uh, if I wanted to go there um, in order to contribute to a book. And the offer came with um, a very detailed travel itinerary where I would be able to meet all kinds of different people and see different things that they're doing, like young Palestinian activists, um, you know, in Ramallah, and then talk to people who uh, do human rights work at the um at the gates where palestinians have to enter israel at these checkpoints and then this and then that and talk to architects and talk to water rights activists and all these different people and um usually when i get asked to go to some other part of the world for something that doesn't have to do with what i'm already working on i would just say no uh because I'm a novelist. And for me, the center of the world is kind of at my desk. Um, mm -hmm. However, that seemed like an opportunity I didn't want to say no to, because I would learn so much, I might even, you know, might transform me in some way. And so I agreed to do it. I can't exactly say I'm glad I did it. But I would say that it trans it did transform me. I stayed with this guy, you know, who was really an um, amazing person and a kind of community leader. And I just thought everything that he was doing was so um, revelatory because he was, he had a very gentle attitude and yet was making real changes to the community where he lived. Um, and he had this enormous charisma. And I, I, you know, who doesn't love people with charisma? I think that it's, to think about how charisma works and when people are aware that they have it and how they use it is really interesting to me. Um, but then he was murdered right after I left. 
And it sort of made me think, step back and think, you know, I didn't ask to, I didn't invite this kind of violence into my life knowingly, yet there it is. Yeah, yeah, I, I believe you, you, you told that in that book, didn't you? I did mention right at the end of the essay yeah. that he was murdered. That's right, yeah, boy. Not something you take lightly. <laughs> no. I mean, that, that, so that one was sort of unusual for me. But um, anyway, um, but you know, sometimes it's like these opportunities present themselves and you go with them following the path of least resistance in a way, I guess. Like sometimes if I'm invited somewhere, I'll go um, not because it's part of my plan, but because somebody else thinks it should be part of my plan. And then after the fact, it was part of your plan all along. You know what I mean? Well, sure. Yeah. It's like more than 50% of your life has lived that way. <laughs> um, and you'd be kidding yourself if you thought otherwise. If being a novelist is like being an artist in a certain sense, in that you're trying to figure out how to move forward and activate your own sensibility, but also be receptive to what comes naturally, what's there, what you see in your environment, rather than looking for some inspiration that you're imagining. When I think about your work, it always looks like Ed Ruscha, and yet it's not limited or branded to have that look. It's more like you seem to have a good detector to know what realm is yours to adopt, to grab, to move into. Well, I, I wish it added up in one, two, three fashion. Um, that would make it much clearer to understand, but I'm, I feel like it's, uh, there's kind of a, a rattle box of ideas that are in this box. You can shake it up almost, uh, you know, like put it in a blender and um, out come these things that are um, that are governed by um, a nervous activity that I committed to decades ago. And I said, here I am an artist and I'll just keep doing this. So anyway, it's, um, Trying to understand it is uh, much more difficult than it seems. I would imagine so, just based on my own personal experience. Do you ever look at the work of other artists, like either people who came before you or peers, and think, at least on first thought, that it's that they're having an easier time of it, or that their work seems to all be of a piece in a way that, from the way outside, seems simpler? Do you know what I'm? Yeah, yeah. I mean, some artists seem to be uh, have gone through their lives writing their own history, and uh, and others make it look easy. Others make it look hard. And, and um, I constantly see uh, power in young artists' work. I mean, these these are like twenty year olds today that are painting pictures and and. Uh, writing music and uh, writing books. Some artists have looked back on it and said, ah, it's just one big conspiracy. It's all been said. There's nothing new to, not so. It just keeps coming and keeps evolving in uh, new kind of fractured ways of looking at a subject that um, an artist has worked through can sometimes be brand new. And, uh, it might be based on other art, but it's it's in its own way brand new. So I think the, you know, this idea that everything's been said before is not true. Oh, I would agree with that. I mean, it's cyclical that somebody comes around and says something like that. But yeah. I mean, your work in particular seems to make so much of things that are a copy or reproducible, even mechanically in terms of type. I was thinking about how you said you were so influenced by Duchamp 
but that the Duchamp you saw was a reproduction. I may have also said that about uh, Jasper Johns, who painted uh, um, a bullseye. Yeah. And um, that was kind of earth shaking when I saw that, but I didn't see the painting. I can imagine Walter Hopps standing in front of that painting and, and uh, really utilizing everything that's in that painting to make a, you know, a study of that thing. But I didn't see that. I saw it in a little postage stamp size reproduction. And, um, and that made all the difference to me. And I just said, well, I don't care if I ever see that painting again. I love it. I don't have to see it in person, but as time, we're in this time travel. And of course I go to museums and all that. And I do see this painting and it's got much more in it that than I saw in that reproduction, but it was the reproduction that made the impression on me. I'd give my right arm to be ambidextrous. That's something that Yogi Berra said. <laughs> yeah. I think someone should uh, look into his life. Uh, like a certain kind of pun. Yeah. Some kind of puns. I've gathered some quotes of his and they're pretty good. They should make a book of his quotes. Can you think of another one off the top of your head? Uh, well, there's one called, let me see now, what is it? Uh, it's, uh, I already learned from all the mistakes I never made. Things like that, you know, that involve negatives and double negatives. And um, I got that from um, growing up in Oklahoma where people would use double negatives all the time. I can't find my keys nowhere. Right. You know, language misuse and um, all of that kind of stuff is uh, kind of fertile in a way. You know, it's got, it's, uh, there are lessons behind all those things. Well, lessons are more like um, open roads. Open roads to Armageddon or wherever. <laughs> open roads. I mean, the vanishing point itself in the canvas leads nowhere. But you have a kind of, you have a style of punning, I think, yourself. Like there was one interview where you're talking about scale. And that if you paint a specific object like an ashtray, you would want to make the dimensions of the ashtray in the painting the same as the dimensions of the actual object, be it five inches or whatever. Yeah. And then you say, but what size is a word? I did carry on like that for a few years, uh, making things their actual size. Uh, except for the gasoline stations or something like that. When you said size of things, it's uh, my old late friend, uh, Bob Wade, Daddy O. Wade said, um, if you can't make it good, make it big. If you can't make it big, make it red. <laughs> I could uh, see you using that statement in a painting, but. I could almost, but I, don't see myself doing it. Uh, let me ask you this. Do you know the writer, writer Tom McCarthy? Tom McCarthy? Yeah. Yeah, I've read his books. I don't know him personally. Um, I liked one book of his in particular, I should say, more Remainder? than the other. Remainder. Not oh, okay. I've got it right in front of me to send it to you, so you don't need it. <laughs> well, but, you know, I like that you had that idea. So you read that book and liked it. I did. Yeah, and then subsequently I met him and he's written a thing about my work for a catalog and I, I actually, I love that book, you know. I mean, I do, I got into the um, world of four edge paintings, which are paintings on the edge of books, you know, uh, uh, called the four edge of a book. And uh, they're blind, they're called blind four edges and they're paintings of uh, usually, no artist ever identifies themselves. They, you know, they never sign the work. So it's almost like painting on teacups or something, but you fan the pages out and the, and the illustration, the painting will show itself. And then when you relax the book and put it back, you don't see the painting. You, you know what I mean? I, 
I think so, meaning the painting exists inside the book. Let me see, what can I do? Can you show me one? Are these like anonymous artworks that you're how about, looking for? How about a book called The Hard Crowd? Okay, see? Uh, all right, now see that, that that's the four edge right there. Yeah. And then if you do this, like this, you get a picture of oh. the Edinburgh Castle or something like that, that people paint. And they're usually scenes like golfing scenes or or fox hunts or idealistic kinds of activities in the world. And they're, they usually take an old book, a leather bound book uh, printed in 1850 or something. And these things are painted probably in the 1940s or 50s by anonymous people who just love to do that sort of stuff. And it's, it's uh, must be nerve wracking to paint something like that where you have to fan the pages like this and paint on the very edge and then let it relax and then you gild the top of it to cover up any um, mistakes that's the kind of book collecting i got into and i've kind of i've more or less exhausted the subject i don't see anybody else making those things exhausted it in terms of like um the number of examples of it you've found yeah. They've been repetitive after a while. Too many Edinburgh castles. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not something you would ever want to make some version yes, of. Yes, I did make one myself. I could even grab it, show it to you. Um, I'd love to see it. Um, I mean, I don't know whether we have time to do that. Do we? I mean, can I exit scene here and get this thing? It's fine with me. He's coming back in here. And... Uh, I made um, 200 and 230 of these things that were made in a workshop in, in uh, Tampa. And uh, the workshop produced these books. Um, and this is silver leaf. So if you do this, let me see. Oh. Just kidding. Okay. Oh. Yeah. You turn it upside down here. Can you read that? It's hard to read. No, it says. Yeah, no. No. Yeah. So, oh, no. And um, anyway, it's, it's the only multiple forage book that I know that exists and uh that's just sort of a corner of my practice you recreated that chocolate room for this show that's up right now in Oklahoma and I asked Eddie about that I said oh did you get to go there for the install and he said no you know because of COVID um stayed home and um, he said, but I've seen it installed before, I guess, at MoCA. And he said, and people graffitied on the chocolate. That's true. Yeah. Well, they did that. I first did that thing in 1970 in uh, Venice, Italy, at the American um, Pavilion. I had a room there, and uh, I was uh, making some silkscreen prints with uh, un, unconventional organic materials and and chocolate was one of them. And so I thought um, uh, shingles of chocolate paper hanging on a wall, uh, a simple enough uh, idea in itself. And, and then doing this thing with some uh, help of some assistants was there graffiti in its first instance? Not everywhere, not every venue, uh, but it was uh, it was done in Reno, Nevada, and it was done in Mo Mocha, maybe a couple of times, and uh, and then it was done in Anchorage, Alaska, and uh, now Oklahoma City, which I haven't seen but I've seen pictures of it. Does the idea of the graffiti bother you? Not so much because uh, the physical activity of chocolate being printed on paper will also have its own 
life, you know, like weird things happen because of the milk in the chocolate or the, the lack of or something will make the uh, color, the, the brown color of the chocolate react and bloom with, with sort of bloom shapes. I and, saw that in photos. Oh, you saw that? Yeah, just that some yeah. of it has a kind of, it looks kind of white. Yeah, and so there's no uh, uh, control of, of anything like that. So graffiti is only a, an, another thing to add to that. Um, and that's sort of man-made. So you got the natural and you got the man-made and how can you fight that? It's a, a toughie. Yeah. Well, I wish I could see that chocolate room. I bet it smells good. Yeah, it, sm it does. 